Welcome to the Salience Podcast, where we identify what stands out from all the noise. Our guest in this episode of the Salience Podcast is Brian Rivera. He's a former Top Gun pilot, co-author of The Flow System, The Evolution of Agile and Lean Thinking in an Age of Complexity, and he's the co-founder and CEO of AGLX North America. For those of you that haven't come across The Flow System, Their body of work takes a deep dive into teaming and the science behind teamwork, systems theory and flow. It really focuses on how systems and processes can enable high performance. Brian's work with the Flow Consortium offers an important contribution for leaders and organizations looking to innovate and step up into the high performance realm. Where our book, Resilience by Design, very much takes an inside out view of resilience, whereby we... Where our book, Resilience by Design, very much takes an inside-out view of resilience, whereby we place responsibility for our states and decisions firmly with us as individuals, we also acknowledge that the embodied mind is connected, or entangled might be a better word, with our external world. We say that we can both shape and be shaped by our external environment. What I'm particularly interested in exploring in our interview today is the relationship between personal resilience and how we make sense of the world around us and how systems and leaders can create the conditions for our best selves to emerge. Please enjoy my conversation with Brian Rivera. You don't, you don't just become a Top Gun pilot. There's a lot of stuff happens before you get there. Uh, a lot of beliefs, a lot of attitudes, a lot of experiences that prepare you to be able to get into that kind of role. And, and before I before I go I go any further, I'm really interested to know what your what really what your childhood days were like, uh, and what's what kind of influenced you from those really early days. I'm fascinated by this way that we have early experiences and they prepare us for later life. What can you tell me about your early life? Uh, I wanted to be a truck driver. Uh, that's number one. Um, a first generation college graduate, so. You know, nobody in my family went to college. It's, it, it was very rare to see anybody go to college at all. Um, I also wanted to work at Kodak because that's where my family worked. So that's what I knew. I, I grew up in, in a blue collar family, uh, lower middle class. Uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, grew up a minority. I guess I'm still a minority, but I really don't consider myself a minority. Uh, so it, it was it was a very different for me. Um, all public schools, so sometimes I get my merge wicks when I talk. That's, that's a joke, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, public school education. Um, I, I got lucky in high school. Uh, I was actually playing a lot of music. This sounds really goofy, but uh, I became a band geek. I marched drum and bugle corps, which is really where I learned a lot about teamwork uh, and breathing, actually, because you have to learn how to breathe properly to play a, a, a horn at the time. Um, and then, uh, really followed music for until it was about my early twenties and, uh, never thought about joining the military until graduating college, right, right around the time I graduated college. So, um, of course I saw the movie Top Gun. Of course I saw all the things when I was younger. I saw the blue angels when I was a kid and I always dreamt about uh, doing that, but I didn't know, um, that anybody could do it. I, I thought it was only for the elite those that uh, come from the upper middle class, uh, I thought it was only for those that were quote unquote white. Um, you know, I, I thought it was for those that had family members that were prior military. So I had no chance of doing any of this stuff, but I was wrong and I'm glad I was wrong. So a uh, family friend came along, um, talked to me about going to college, what it's like. I got into engineering school at the University of Colorado and then, uh, you know, partying my butt off at, at, at the university and ended up with an economics degree. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's how that's that's my early childhood going into this. Um, you know, um, I, I do, can go into more detail, but uh, very rare, I think, uh, that a guy like me ends up flying in, in the U.S. Navy. Yeah, I I asked this question for a couple of reasons. I'm really genuinely interested in people's early early experiences and how they prepare them for, for future. But also this is, this is a great metaphor for complexity and, and leadership. You know, you wanted to be a truck driver and you am a top gun pilot and there's absolutely no way 
back when you were a kid, you could have predicted that you would be a Top Gun pilot. And, and, and so it is with leadership. You know, we're, in, we're helping organizations chart a course to the future uh, that you can't possibly know where people are going to end up. And if you'd, if you'd set your mind on a, on a rigid plan to be a truck driver, you'd be driving a truck right now. But you know, look at the varied career you've had, and, and I think that for me is, that for me is just fascinating. Um, you said that you were a horn player in a band, and that really set you up to, to become a Top Gun pilot, and you said that taught you some of the fundamentals of teamwork. What did you learn at that point? What was it about that that taught you teamwork? Uh, well, if you look at, look at a jazz ensemble, you know, you have to really adapt to changing environments in jazz. And that's really what I had to plan in, in high school. So I actually made it into a uh, college level jazz ensemble as a lead trumpet. And that was the lead trumpet uh, in, our, in our Colorado State um, uh, jazz ensemble. So I also won the All-American Jazz Festival with, the, with Disney World. So we took a small group of uh, uh, musicians from a inner city school uh, and we competed against the big uh, schools that were out there and we won. And the way we won was because of our, I hate to say it, it was our, inter our interactions. All of us were pretty good with our technical skills, but it was how we worked together that was phenomenal. And it was, thinking back to this, Ian, it was a very cognitively diverse group of folks uh, that uh, were working together. So uh, I hadn't thought about that in a while. But I also marched drum and bugle corps uh, and that's where you go out there and you march on a football stadium field. You play 12 or 13 minutes worth of music and you march and, and you run around as fast as you can and you perform. Right. So it's that intonation that that how do you tune into everybody? How do you get your spacing right? How does somebody set the spacing? Um, how, how do you look uniform across the, uh, the field? So if you think about it, I went from a uh, I think it's called a sequential team um, type of world to a reciprocal team. Uh, where we have a high level of uh, task interdependence, if you will, and you end up in a dynamic resource of, or dynamic allocation of resources. You're, you're going back and forth, playing off each other in a jazz ensemble. And then that marching band is more like a American football team, you know, where you have set plays and you execute those plays. So um, that was really cool to work in that environment growing up. And I had, I didn't think that would mean anything until um, you know, about five to seven years ago when I realized how important it was to be on, the, you know, grow up in that, that, that type of teamwork and then uh, understand the value that music has and getting our minds to think differently, to see things differently, right? So um, the, the music background, the marching background, the jazz ensemble background, um, those are the high, some of the highest levels of teamwork you could see. At yeah, I think um. The, the two guys I, I work most closely with in Hobart here uh, are both professional musicians. They, they're they also in the Navy, uh, in the Navy band. Uh, Dorian, our, our chief ops guy, is a professional trumpet player, uh, and he's going to be pretty grumpy that I'm doing this interview rather than him because he'd have a thousand questions to ask you about these these relationships. Uh, and, and Greg uh, is a chief petty officer, and he... He's mainly a lead singer, but he does everything. And when we first began training uh, uh, teams and and looking at the relationship between flow and teams, he did a lot of stuff with the Navy band, looking at inducing flow state and training flow state before going on stage and looking at changes in performance with flow uh, and with using perceptual positions, so the training, the, the the material we've got in our book in chapter uh, five, I think it is, and training people how to do first person, second person, and third person. Uh, so that's first person is being aware of yourself. Second is being as if you're in another's shoes, and the third is being able to step right out and see everything as if you're a fly on the wall. And what was fascinating is he reported incredible changes in group flow. Uh, and that that teamwork, uh, and he could feel the changes in the music with re with respect to the training. Um, so, yeah, I think it's fascinating that that was such a precursor for you. Uh, how did you manage to articulate that in your book with John Turner and Nigel uh, in the flow system? 
Well, well, what's amazing is I didn't really look back at the uh, at my childhood to for that influence. I really looked at we really we really looked back at the the time in the cockpit and what we learned in the in the military. So John was in the uh, uh, Merchant Marines. Uh, John Turner was Professor Turner was. So we have a little bit of overlap there, uh, but. It wasn't until we learned a little bit more, until I learned more about fractals and the importance of, of fractals in our world that uh, I went back to music. And I, if I understand this correctly, um, humans don't like the automatic music that's being produced right now. It, it, it doesn't sound good to our ears. And it's because there's there's no, uh, you, you don't hear the the minor changes right the beat changes and all that our, our minds are designed for that so go back um to how vibrations in the world work and, and how geometry influences music uh which is pretty fascinating in itself um i, I wish we would have looked at more at that now that i think about it but uh, maybe that's something we could put in the next book is is the music musical side of uh of the influences on on teamwork which it's absolutely there yeah yeah i absolutely agree and um yeah, I understand what you mean about some of those some of those subtleties. Uh, I um, my one of my great mentors is a guy called John Grinder, who uh, was ex ex military, uh, trained in uh, developed neuro linguistics, uh, speaks many languages, and and his his big passion was modelling uh, exemplars from around the world, whether it would be horse trainers, musicians. Uh, all sorts of different people uh, modeling language. Uh, and, and he tells a story of being taught how to play drums by a, an, an African drummer called Tito. Uh, and, and John just wanted to do all the really crazy, funky stuff, uh, you know, all the really sort of uh, glamorous, you know, um, showy material. And, and, and Tito said, I, I just want you to do this really simple beat. And John goes, yeah, yeah, I've got it, look. And he just shook his head and he said, no, you don't. Practice that until you've got it. Months and months, 18 months went by, and he wouldn't teach him a damn thing until he could get something subtle in here that had no words. And uh, anyway, John kept going with this because this was like the best African drummer in the world, and he wouldn't teach him it. He just wouldn't teach him anything. And he tells this story. He was playing at a concert one day, and Tito was in the, in the audience, and John was just a minor role playing this sort of background beat. And he said he suddenly felt that he got it. He felt it in his body that suddenly something had changed. And it was the same basic thing that he'd been doing for 18 months. And he, and he felt this difference. And he looked up and Tito in the audience, like sat down in this field, looked up and gave him a nod and said, now you've got it. Yeah. You know, that, that nonverbal. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a feeling. And going back to jazz, um, you know, when you're playing on the back end of a beat, which we call it all the time, it's it's hard to explain. It's it, you have to feel it, you have to experience it, and that's what you're doing is you're experiencing the music. And it isn't until then that you um, you can't achieve flow, any type of group flow at least. Uh, and that's what it is, right? It, it's when you get in that state of flow where things are just happening, and that's that's what we're trying to get to. But it, I tell you, it's a, it's a great place to be too. When you get there, it's not sustainable, but you do want to get there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you say it's not sustainable. I think a lot of the training and, and coaching that I've been doing for the last 10 years has been uh, particularly with elite performers, athletes, combat athletes, um, is training them how to access flow and stabilize it long enough for that peak performance. It is transient, uh, but, but if we can hold it for that peak performance, the peak performance just goes to a, to a whole new level. Yeah. And there's something about being live in front of people that elevates it. There's that more, you have more risk, you have more novelty, more uncertainty. You need that to achieve flow, right? So even though you may practice at a, at a high level, sometimes you're going, your performance is going to be better than that because of the, the environment, the context you're in, right? And that's the same thing in combat. That's the same thing in, in, uh, in training scenarios when we're flying aircraft. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's critical to flow. You got to have uh, some uncertainty, some risk there. Yeah, look, absolutely. I, I'm really interested in that feeling of group flow uh, and not just in music, but I wonder if you, if you think back on some of the teamwork that you've done, if, you can f if you've got that sense of when it clicks and you know you've got great teamwork happening, can you feel that group flow? Yeah, 
Yeah, and and the the I can't explain what it feels like, but I can tell you what the conditions are like. Uh, when you when you when we plan the plan, we brief the plan, we execute the plan, and debrief the plan. When you brief it and things change, and you do not need to communicate with anybody about the changes that are happening, just subtle brevity, you know, calm brevity, uh, and we just pick up on what we're supposed to do next. That's 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 really cool. If you have to spend a lot of time explaining what we're going to do next, you, it's hard to be in in um, any type of flow state, right? It, so, um, it, you know, how, how do we get there? I think it has to do with, the, again, the interactions, uh, the expectations, the role changes, the, as the leadership changes on whoever has the most situational awareness gets to determine the direction of the flight or the, or the division or the strike. Um, th that's pretty powerful, right? Uh, there's no one leader. All the egos are blended the best they can be. There, there's, there's one ego, if you will. It's not multiple egos it's one and it's blended egos that matter so um yeah it, it's it's critical that uh guys like me and you th the reason we do what we do is because we want to help others achieve it and we always want to get back to it ourselves right yeah i've got i've got multiple lines of questions now i'm going to see if i can thread all these together because I'm, I'm curious about so many things the the first one is You've you've been in an environment. In fact, you've been in a couple of environments of of peak flow and peak group flow. Uh, you've been pay, playing jazz ensembles at a very high level, at, at, at the highest level, and you've been flying uh, fighter aircraft at the very highest level. And and both of those are about flow. And 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 I think that there's a common there's a common perception that the that you need flow to operate in that environment and i think that's true i think what what's really happening though is that we're attracted to those environments because we're flow junkies we love flow and we go there because that's the place that we can get the flow um when you when you when you change careers and you're no longer flying at that high level did you find that you had to go elsewhere to find flow, to fill the gap? Um, I, I, haven't, I didn't think about it in that term. I, I'll say this. I think a lot of folks that are, have our similar backgrounds, when they leave this environment uh, and go to a normal, a quote unquote, normal environment, it, it, it's painful, right? Um, we, we lose sense of self. Uh, we lose sense of connection. Um, we, we just, I would say a lot of us would, tend to believe we, we can never get back there again. And I, I disagree with that. Uh, we're always trying to create that. But some of my friends uh, from the community, they would you know, skydive. Um, some would take it to the other extreme. And this is this is dangerous, too. Is, and that's drug addiction, right? Drug addiction is, is mm -hmm. can can fill that void, if, if you will. And we see a lot of that uh, with with veterans these days. And that's that's dangerous, too. So, um, yeah, you know, going back to your question, uh, what did I seek out afterwards? Uh, I think, I think reading, <laughs> I hate to say it, but, uh, focus time, just reading something and learning something was uh, important to me. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really interesting that you, you choose reading and learning this, this pattern we we're engaged in, you know, we're, we're frontline mind. We're, we're looking to help frontline operatives across all of those businesses, those agencies where they've got skin in the game. You know, we, we talk about our, our passion is helping people where if they get things wrong, people die or, you know, there are, there are dire consequences. And of course, they prov provide a great service to, to us and community, which is, which is our passion, you know, supporting those, those people. And a lot of what we do is transition coaching. It's where the, the signals in the body uh, stress, trauma, whatever they might be, are really crying out to, hey, you need to get out now. You've done your time. You can't keep doing this. It's not sustainable. You've done it for a period of time, but there's often a, a real reluctance to, to change. And as you say, it's that change in identity. It's a, it's a loss of self. Uh, and it's about, it's often about finding different ways of accessing flow. And you mentioned two there, skydiving and drug taking, and, and a third with reading and learning in your case. And we find that this part of the transition is critical 
to find a way where they can still have that peak experience. And it can be anything. It can be cooking. It can be music. It can be whatever. But often they just forget. They forget that there are other ways that you can you can have that, you know, wow, I feel amazing. I feel alive. I've, I've accessed flow, which means I've stopped thinking. I've stopped worrying. I've stopped stressing about where I've come from and who I am. Uh, for us, this is a critical part of that transition. And I think for your veterans in, in the not-for-profit and in the, in the way that you're helping, uh, I think psychedelics can be part of that that journey. Uh, I think there are other ways as well. But I think ultimately what we're looking to do is to, is to find alternatives to do that mapping about what motivates us. And I think always ask, asking that question, what can you do that's going to give you that experience elsewhere but that's safe, you know, it doesn't involve uh, drug addiction and, ta- and, and, and taking risk at a level where you might die. Does that sound reasonable to you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, this sounds funny, but, uh, you know, a guy like me talking about mindfulness or meditation or yoga, um, breathing, box breathing, just any type of breathing technique. Um, you know, I'd punch myself five years ago if I heard myself talking about that today, right? I'd be going back. But these are things that uh, you know a lot of high performers from the military are into right now. Uh, you know, running is a good thing. Walking is a great thing. Um, just being getting out of the house is a great thing too, right? So uh, you don't have to do much. There's different ways to get there, right? It, it, but you got to find what works for you, as long as it's not going to kill you, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. I think I think in addition to flow, there's something else I'm I'm interested in about teamwork and that's this idea and it's really popular at the moment people are starting to wake up to psychological safety you know this idea that if i'm safe and i can participate i can make mistakes that are obviously survivable you know safe to fail type type experiences um then i can access uh, you know we can we can work well as a team Uh, and um i i'm what what's your experience of psychological safety both when when you've had it and when you don't have it, I mean, you've, you've got a military background, so, you know, that can be hit and miss. Yeah. So go back to where I, I actually learned it from and I, we didn't know we were learning it. Uh, I'll go back to a brief I had in, uh, in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, my instructor was a female pilot at the time. And I remember, I can't remember her name. I apologize, but, uh, we get back from a flight and this is where, when I realized what was happening, uh, she'd ask, you know, um, ask questions about the flight, but she would preface that with the things that she did wrong, right? I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I'm like, what, what? I'm looking around like, what's going on here? I didn't know then, but that's what we're conditioned to do in naval aviation. A lot of aviation is to admit our failures in front of others, right? Show that we're human. And uh, we did that through effective debriefing. And it's just a culture of it. They don't sit down and go, here's psych safety. Here's how you do it. It just, it, it just was, right? And in fact, when you look at one of the primary researchers on psychological safety, Amy Edmondson from Harvard, she actually studied uh, healthcare workers who were trained by former aviators, right, on on these things. Mm -hmm. So you're going into a surgical team and seeing how they work together. She observed these things. Um, This is what they're doing. They're admitting uh, that they're fallible, that they're human, that they make mistakes, saying, I'm sorry, things like that. Okay, well, that came from fighter aviation, which is pretty cool, and and commercial aviation, uh, because we we would plan, we'd execute, and we assess, and that assessment piece is that inside outside criticism of ourselves um, where we throw darts at ourselves and say, I did this wrong. I did that wrong. What do you have for me? Um, That's really where I learned it. Right. Uh, But fast forward to, you know, 10 years, 12 years after I got done flying, psychological safety pops up. Everybody's talking about it. And I'm like, this isn't anything new. This is what we've been doing for years. Uh, The other side of that is when do you know you don't have it? Well, right now we don't have a lot of it in, in the world. Right. Um, if you say something, um, online, if you do something, uh, you're going to be called an extremist if it's not with the, the current narrative of the day, right? If, if you see something differently than everybody else, um, and this goes back to inattentional blindness. If, if, you know, the 17% that see things that others don't, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means that, um, it's a weak signal. So if you see a weak signal, you should say something, but we're now in an environment where if you say something, because you Mm -hmm. see a weak signal. Uh, you're going to be labeled an extremist. You're going to be labeled a, a tin a tin foil hat wearer. Uh, you're going to get all kinds of labels. You're going to get canceled. So, so it's not a good environment right now to see it, say something, right? Um, so guys like me just self censor and we don't say anything anymore, right? We do 
when we're with our bros talking about stuff. But uh, I think it's a very dangerous thing that's happening right now. Uh, so yeah, we're seeing two extremes. I've seen two extremes, one from fighter aviation and two to current day and what's happening. And the same thing's true in organizations. Um, leaders need to be the people that create uh, the condition for psychological safety to exist. They need to admit failure. They need to add, ask probing questions. There's many things that leaders can do to create it, but it can't be done with a magic wand, right? You can't wave your magic wand and say, this is a safe environment. Uh, this is Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That doesn't work. So it really comes down to leadership behavior. And uh, the best place I've seen that is, is in the military and in, in fighter aviation. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I absolutely agree that this, this concept of, of not feeling safe, uh, of, of not being able to admit mistakes is, is a critical issue across all of the organizations I'm currently working with. Right. And them. then there's something else here. It's, it's the, uh, the context, the environment too, the, the system. Uh, using naval aviation as another example, uh, if you admit you have a cold, if you say you need uh, some mental health health help, um, that's not a good thing. You're gonna, you know, that's gonna keep you from flying. So guess what? You you hold it in, or you go find help on your own. So you're not in a psychologically safe environment to admit that you need help, and that's a that's a constraint that we had in in all of aviation. It is very very dangerous because. Um, Right now, pilots are flying aircraft that have mental conditions that aren't noted, right? I hate to say mental conditions. They're suffering from trauma of some type. Um, do you really want that person flying that aircraft? Now, hopefully, hopefully the answer is no. But um, perhaps there's a system constraint that is preventing them from getting the help they need. And, and, and you know, that's, that's psychological safety, too. Um, if you don't have that safety to admit that you need help, you're not going to ask for it. And that's the environment we're in as well uh, today. I think a lot of people need help and they're just not admitting it or can't admit it. Yeah. We've been running uh, a SenseMaker project called Resilience Scan across many, many frontline agencies, uh, health, um, you know, first responders, uh, hospitals, uh, health services, uh, correctional officers, police, military, all sorts of different frontline roles. And we, we ask an open-ended question, which is, you know, tell us a story of experience in your workplace. So it's just really vague, you know, people put down whatever's going on for them. And then we ask questions about that to, to derive patterns. Uh, and there, you know, you know how SenseMaker works, I know. We, we ask, you know, does, is this a, a, a positive or negative experience? Where on the scale of, is that? And then we ask them a question that relates to a triangle. And they they start off with a dot in the middle of the triangle. We invite them to move the dot. We, they can say no, this is not applicable. And the question is, does your story reflect a sense of threat? No, it doesn't. You can tick a box, or yes, it does. And the sense of threat comes from either the enemy, if it's a military organisation, uh, your commanding officer, uh, or your your peers. So that would be a military context. In a health context, we go the patient at the top, your manager you know, or your, or your colleagues and the, out of thousands and thousands of stories, the overwhelming majority of people in frontline agencies are ticking the box or not ticking the box that there's no, they're saying yes. And the triangle is almost predominantly from manager or commanding officer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the leadership. It's the system that's driving the behavior, right? Um, and and yeah. Yeah, going back to mental health and naval aviation, you know, and even having a security clearance, uh, when you go up for your security clearance review, you're asked if you have any, have you met with a mental health professional? And generally the answer is going to be no, because if, if you put yes, it's going to delay things. And, and it's a game that people play. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, it's, it's, you know, the enemy is not always the, uh, our opponent. It's, it's sometimes the folks that we're working with or the system we're working with. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. And I think it's absolutely the same for, for healthcare professionals, particularly if they're doctors. If they say that and they admit, hey, I've got a mental health condition, I'm being treated at the moment, there's a risk that they can be deregistered whilst they're being, you know, they've got this going on. And I think, I think there's some really important framing here for us. We, we always talk about ourselves as being coaches. Uh, we, don't, we never offer a diagnosis, so people can never be compromised by having a mental health diagnosis. You're just coming in for high-performance coaching. And guess what? People are really happy to come and get high performance coaching because there's no stigma attached. Uh, we know that elite performers all have high performance coaches. 
So we, we find this is such a, a so much better frame. Yeah, and the connection to well-being and, and being on a high-performing team and employee engagement, it's, it's you know, they're, they're highly connected there, right? We've, we've got to make sure that, uh, uh, and I think this is the future of coaching too, is when you start coaching high-performance organizations, high-performance teams, you start getting the individual coaching like you do, um, I, I think you do, uh, that, that's the next evolution of, of coaching is bringing it all together, right? Yeah, yeah. There's something else I've, I've noticed. Uh, we've done a lot of work on recovery uh, with with frontline professionals who've had trouble with, uh, they've, they've had experiences in the workplace. It could be death, um, carnage, uh, whatever it might be. You know, and we talk about trauma. Uh, they've usually got a diagnosis. By the time they see us, they've got a diagnosis of, of PTSD. Uh, and I, I think that I think the term's misplaced. I think often it's not it's not really a post traumatic stress response it's still contemporary in the way that they're making sense of the world and i think i don't think it's disordered either i think it's usually highly ordered there's all sorts of disordered consequences but there's often a very ordered pattern to what's going on very well intended but this is really interesting every single frontline person i've worked with has had a complicating factor which is around their their experiences uh, with the system, with their leaders, with their managers and the way they've been treated. And um, I wonder if you've, you've had that uh, experience w- with the sort of veterans that you've been working with, how there's a, this complication. Sometimes they talk about moral injury. You know, I, I had this happen over here, but this is the way I was treated. And this is, my, this is now the thing that's, that, that's my sticking point. Right. So, yeah, a lot of, lot of experience recently in talking to veterans about this. And what I understand about trauma, it's not, you know, it's not the event that happens to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of the events that happen to you. So uh, as they start to add up, you know, you can, you can, I can experience the same horrific event and have two different outcomes. Your reaction to it may be different than mine. Uh, and then you can be walking down the streets, you know, shopping one day and, and have an anxiety attack because you, it, something triggered that, it, you know, it's, it's uh, so, so all these things add up. Um, but you know, in the big picture, it's, it's you know, the way we react to traumatic events is based on our genetics. Um, and, and I think, you know, this as well, you know, I believe that uh, any trauma uh, in our parents and our grandparents, and you go back five or six generations can be carried through the genes down to you. It's a, it's a factor of your culture. Um, you know, going back to naval aviation, hey, you know, we work in a culture where we don't talk about mental health uh, for the most part. That's a cultural thing uh, locally to enable aviation. Your previous experience, hey, you know, did you punch out of an aircraft? Did you lose a friend? In my case, uh, when I was flying in the uh, Bay of Bengal, I swapped out aircraft uh, last minute, and then the, uh, the person I swapped out with never came back, right? They went supersonic in the, in the water. Uh, so you have to live with things like that. But it's, it's, it's all of these things that add up and determine how we react to, to events, right? Uh, so there's a lot of that these days. And if, from what I understand, the world you're in, you're, when you're working with first responders, they have a higher level of, um, I hate to say PTSD, but they have a higher level of trauma because they see more than most uh, most of us do, most most uh, military folks do, right? So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered that, that, that question completely. If you want to re- uh, ask it to me again, I can probably do a better job of cleaning that up. I, I think you said something that's absolutely critical. Uh, and you had a turn of phrase, and I've not quite captured it, but it's it's two people can have the same, can be in the same situation, the same external context, and they can have radically different responses to it. And and the trauma is about what you create inside yourself. It's not the external world. And, and this is critical. This is the first place we go with coaching. Often what happens is they'll come in and they'll say, well, this happened to me and it made me do this. And we have to break that cause and effect link. We have to put the agency back into the person. And often there'll be a lot of pushback and they'll be really, you know, to, to use the term, they'll be really pissy. They'll be really grumpy. They'll say, hey, no, this, is, this, this made me do I did not have choice here. And we have to find a way to keep rapport long enough to be able to introduce that agency and, and allow them to discover that there are, in fact, different ways of responding. A really simple, I'll give you a really simple example. Um, for frontline responder, uh, first on the scene for a car accident. It's one of a, one of hundreds of these events that they've been to. But this one has two children that have been killed. 
and suddenly that's the that's the trigger it's the tip out and it's often children we're, we're as, as frontline professionals are often really okay with with hum, with adult humans but children are the are the big trigger uh, you know and there's an image sets up uh, every time he sees children getting into a car there's there's this full color image and then a felt sensation in the body which is a traumatic response and um this is in full color the, he's got a replay that's happening in full color uh, of this event that he'd seen so it takes quite a while to sort of unpack and get rapport here but switching the the image from color to black and white as a first step uh, started to break this sensation, the felt sensation in the body. The, the physical response was no longer as strong. And then we could distance the image and then we could put it into movies. There's lots and lots of stuff we could do at that real basic level of sensing and, and making sense of the world. Uh, and I think that is, you know, I'm trying to unpack here what you said there about that internal response. So I think that's that's critical. And if I remember correctly, uh, the way our brain works is, uh it's not a tape being replayed in our brain, right? We're reconstructing the past and it changes as we go. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, the big idea now is you, you kind of shake the snow globe, snow globe up, if you will, your brain up to access some novel connections so you can see things differently. You can do that many ways. Uh, you know, actually debriefing, the way I understand it is effective debriefing with folks is a good way to do it. Uh, the mindfulness and yoga and breathing. There's, there's, there's many techniques out there and, and psychedelics are becoming more popular for this, uh, for this reason. You again, I think you've hit the nail right in the head there. Sometimes you just need to shake it up. We we talk about breaking state. We need to we need to do something that's going to really shock somebody out of it, so you can remap new patterns of behaviour, new ways that people can learn. And I think you're absolutely spot on. That's what psychedelics do. Uh, it gives us a. It, it's like it's like in the old your old uh, computer. You go Control Alt Delete and you reset the whole thing, and you go oh, Hang on, now I can. It's 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 it stopped it tripping out. I'll tell you another way we do it, uh, which is we take people, uh, we, we anchor the context and then we detonate the way that they're thinking by inducing flow. We'll put them in a situation where they're so freaking out and they have to find flow that they'll go back in and they'll come back into the context. So we almost anchor it, induce flow, and then take that flow state into the context that they've been experiencing with trauma. Uh, so that's another way of tripping them out. So, so you're ready for the big, the big secret here is there's what we're doing at the individual level, what's going on in your brain there, the, the uh, default mode network, shrinking down that ego, allowing access to the novel connections is the same thing we're trying to do with coaching teams, right? We're trying to bring those egos down, blend them together, uh, break away that default mode network that, that suppresses the entropy, if you will, in that, in that team. Uh, it's the same thing. So th that's why I like doing what we do because it scales, um, at many, many levels, right? So yeah, uh, you're spot on. And, and from what I understand about psychedelics, they do get you into a flow state, right? You're, you're present, you're focused, um, and, and you can remember them. Uh, as far as I, from what I'm hearing from the guys that are doing it, is they can remember what happened and that's important. If you can't remember what happened, like if you went on a bender one night, uh, you know, drank too much alcohol, that, that does no good, right? So yeah. a, lot, a lot of fascinating things happening. Um, around our world today when it comes to mental health, which is, I think, uh, a lot about what we're talking about right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I've got, um, I, I'm just thinking of everything we've covered here and I'm, I'm gonna ask a question that's, it's almost a metaphor, it's, it's, it's a way of synthesizing. You you run a you run a small boutique company, it, it's a niche, you know, you've got a niche offering. Uh, there and I think if you were looking to hire somebody to to come in and work with you, you're looking you know at a high level uh, somebody to 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 partner you and help represent what you do, uh, and and you're at an interview, you, you've got a whole range of candidates. If you can answer, if you could ask only one question, one question, what would that question be to attract somebody who would work with you representing what you do? Wow, you put me on a spot there. Um, yeah, that's a good one. One question. Um, I, I want to. I want to hear about a failure. Um, I, I want to hear uh, about one of their biggest failures um, in 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 a teaming environment, right? Um, and and what they did about it. Um, 
and I think that's that's kind of a cliche thing to ask too. But um, I, I don't have a, a off the top answer for you right now, or an off the, off the top question I would ask. But I think I'm trying trying to talk my way into what I'm looking for, um, some type of failure that they've experienced um, on a team. And it can't be, hey, we got a project late on time. You know, we didn't deliver on time. That's that's pretty standard. That's eighty percent of the answers out there. Uh, I want to know where they where they screwed something up and were called themselves out to account on it, right? Yeah. Well, you just said you didn't give me a top level answer. Well, actually, you did. That that you know, I, I put you on the I put you on the spot there. You had to respond, and you came up with something which is which is off the top, but you. you if you think about that question now, let's unpack that question. That question pretty well tells you what's going to happen when they screw up in your business. They, you want to know that somebody who screws up is going to, going to be on the phone or they're going to call, call you and say, hey, this is not going well. I've done this and this is what's going on. And then you can, get, you can work together to solve this problem to fix, to fix the issue. If somebody buries something that's gone wrong and they don't tell you, then you know, it affects your whole business and it could, it could escalate, it could explode. It, you know, that is a great question to ask. And if, if you're, you know, if somebody gives you a trite answer or it's all oh, like the project was late on time and you say, if that's the biggest failure you've he- ever had, then I don't, I don't want to hire you. You've not had enough experience of failure for me to be able to, for you to be able to work in my business. You don't have enough war stories as a metaphor to be able to come back here and, and really work with the people I'm working with. Cause guess what? They've got millions of dollars and critical failures. They've got lots of things going wrong and you need to be able to understand what that's about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can yeah. think of the, I can think of the, you know, just the one thing I screwed up and that really changed my life was, uh, one of my first times in combat, uh, I forgot to turn off a box that uh, allowed a, a weapon to track on us. Right. And, and, uh, it wasn't until after it exploded, I'm like, oops, <laughs> right. So, yeah. And then uh, wow. from there on, I was like, oh boy. Um, and I think that's what really helped me become a, a decent instructor too, was having that type of experience coming back and going, I almost killed myself, right? Doing something stupid. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think when I reflect on my life and my, my early days, I, I think it's a miracle that I'm still alive. Yeah. The, the <laughs> number of the number of dumb things I've done uh, and for, across most of the domains I've worked in, I've, I've done some extraordinarily risky things and got away with them. Uh, sometimes due to preparation beforehand, sometimes due to dumb luck. Um, so <laughs> I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Luck right. has a lot to do with everything we do too. Right. I mean, we, sometimes we get lucky. We're not good. We just got lucky. <laughs> yeah. I, sometimes we get lucky and, and, and there's some predisposing factors that help us be lucky, like, you know, like a, like a long-term career of accessing flow. I got lucky because I could drop into flow and deal with something that was coming out of left field. So I think we, I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence with luck. I, I, I think we can do a lot to predispose ourselves to be lucky, uh, seize those opportunities, even if they're very marginal, but being able to pull yourself out of something that's seemingly impossible but sometimes there's, you know, precedents or, or things that have happened before that let us get there. Well, I'm, I'm coming towards the end of the interview. I've got a couple of, I've got two last, two last questions for you. The first is, and again, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you could direct people's attention to something in the world, one thing that you could direct people's attention to, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Uh, first thing that came to mind is uh, John Boyd's Oodle Loop, but that, that's that's too obvious for I think you and, and me right now. Um, I think there's a, there's so much in there that uh, we can learn uh, learn from, and it's not just the the loop itself; it's the the history of it. Um, I think there's you know you talk about flow states. If if you want to look at flow, I mean I can explain flow with John Boyd's Oodle Loop. If you want to talk building up, about building a high performing team, I can do the same thing. Um, yeah, and, and understanding complexity and resilience and uh, emergence and, and all that goodness. Um, it's one of the things I would have people look at. Yeah. And if yeah, you want to get into rec- if you want to get into recency bias and uh, yeah, I just read something on the, uh, I mean, hopefully I get this right. Uh, we, with, with Tico, with Tico virus, it's a virus of the mind. That's kind of cool. I just learned a little bit. I was reading some work on um, quantum physics and, and it's a book called quantum revelations and came across this. I'm like, Oh, it's pretty interesting concept that, uh, there's this 
quote unquote virus out there that uh, uh, shuts down flow. Actually, it, it, it does that catch the virus, uh, shut down uh, other information, information from coming from other places, and, and they only listen to what they want to listen to. Oh yeah, wow! I, it's interesting you you raise that one thing OODA loop. I I think I think that's quite possibly the best answer we've had on this podcast yet, and I, I'll ex, I'll explain why. I've had lots of people talk about a particular problem and and, and solving that particular problem. Uh, I think there's something much more fundamental, and it, and it's it's cultural as well. And I, I do think America in particular is suffering from this, and it's the fundamentals of how to think critically. And I think, you know, evidence-based thinking and changing your maps of the world and constantly updating uh, is the is the key. It's not the particular problem of climate change or social inequity or, or, or bias or racism or all of these other things. It's the fundamentals of how we think. And I, I as you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of UDA. Uh, and, and and Boyd and and I've, I've read a lot and I've been been researching this for a little while and we've we've had lots of conversations about that. So I I, I agree with you, and you know whether it's whether it's Uda or whether it's some other thinking pattern, I don't I don't care. But getting down to really updating the way that you learn and the way that you think is is where I would where I would agree with you on that on that answer. No, I'm a big fan of uh, you know the destruction and creation and and the concept that. Uh, you can look at the OODA loop as a way to understand consciousness and how we perceive reality, which is fantastic. So we do have to update those, those maps, those mental models, the schema, the repertoire in our, in, in our mind and body to uh, really understand subjectively what reality is. It's because we can never understand reality from an objective point of view, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. We began this interview and, uh, and you, you've got the young Brian who wants to be a truck driver, uh, and he's had a pretty varied career since being a truck driver. Uh, so, where, what's next? What are your future aspirations, work or elsewhere in your life? Uh, right now, I, I want to work on that book on the what I call the entropic OODA loop. I'm not sure if we're going to call it that or not. Uh, that that's fascinating because it gets into trauma, it gets into flow, uh, gets into understanding um, um, some different ways of thinking about consciousness and perception. Uh, gets into free energy principle. It's it's, it's pretty radical. Um, I think it connects to a lot of ideas out there, including machine learning, AI. Uh, how, how, you know what what we need in our world to understand um, how to avoid future wars, things like that. So that that's something I, I may work on next. Uh, right now, it's my I hate to say it. Actually, I'm going to say this. My my primary focus is is really on helping veterans right now. Um, that's that's taken a lot of effort. Um, you know, some things have happened the last couple of years that really changed my view on, on mental health. So, uh, I, I, you know, if I could stop everything I'm doing right now and if it paid the bills, uh, that's what I would do is uh, focus on that. Uh, if it, since I can't right now, I'm going to continue coaching, continue building the company up. Um, that's awesome. We've, I think we've got a great uh, way to deliver, uh, you know, building high, high performing teams, creating leaders, helping people understand complexity. Uh, in this VUCA world, it's it's perfect for what's going on today. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot, and of course, you brought this up at the beginning about being a, a parent is probably the most challenging thing. That's a blast. Uh, I have two little girls uh, that are just rocking it right now in sports and uh, their education, um, and of course, it, it, they really challenge me to be a, a better coach and, and a better father. So uh, that's a lot of fun too. Is is being a dad? Yeah, great. Yeah, I love it. Really nice, diverse portfolio of, of future aspirations and, uh, and and things that that motivate you. And yeah, I've I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks, thanks heaps, Brian. No, this is fun. Uh, you you really asked some interesting questions that really got me thinking and reflecting back on things I hadn't thought about in years. So this is all really unscripted. I mean, I had no idea I was going to be I was going to be talking about music today, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting when it we often um. There's often a, a, I don't know what you call it, like a, I'll call it an obvious highlight in life. You know, it's this sort of thing that's on your CV, you know, you put it down there, oh, I was a Top Gun pilot and I was an instructor and blah, blah, blah. And people go, oh, wow. But what, what always happens is there's something happened before that that gave you the, the, the stepping stone, the, the prerequisites 
to be able to do that. And for you, there was a few things. There was the music. Um, but there's also something which I didn't I didn't pursue in the interview, but but we could have. And it was um I talk about a tipping point. And for you, there was a friend. There was a relationship with a friend who encouraged you to take a step uh, that, that led you where you were. And, and, and I think sometimes people focus on the kind of big thing, the goal, you know, that career, career highlight, whatever it might be, but it's actually paying attention to the, to the tipping points and the opportunities that come along uh, as we go through life. So I, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by those sorts of things. You know, the little thing, oh, my friend said I could do this. And I went, you know what? Wow. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah, it was it was a power of her father telling me about uh, you know going to school. Um, is it was, it was a, a Jamel is her name. She she came in from Tennessee to Colorado, and when I was living up in Greeley, uh, growing up as a little kid, and um, she showed me how to go to college. Her dad sat me down and said, "Hey, you know this is uh, what college is about." And I'm like, I had no idea I could go to college, so off I went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And how important is it for us? to role model that and to put that back to the world, you know, yeah, the yeah, way that yeah. We, yeah, we call it putting the ladder down, uh, helping us out that they need to help. And, uh, sometimes they're not asking for it, but, uh, you definitely want to give back. Right. And, uh, I think that's, that's going back to what I want to do in the future. That's it. I mean, give back, give back the best I can. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the salience podcast. Please leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also subscribe to the Frontline Mind newsletter by visiting our website at frontlinemind.com. Have you got a topic you would like some more salience on? Send us a message on LinkedIn or email team at frontlinemind.com.